too little. There we go. Um, so where are we? Um, yeah, I think th uh, things are going well now. I'm just uh, running a little behind because you're supposed to do uh, eight gun the chat section two five. It's pretty easy though. I think it was good that we spent a lot of time last time proving the the big things that people actually these these theorems that we're talking about are quite fundamental, namely Newton's method and how it converges. So let's finish that up. Uh, a few words on these other methods and. Uh, and then uh, I'm supposed to go ahead with this section today, actually, but it's no rush uh, because that's going to be the week after. Anyway, for this Tuesday, you have a few problems on Newton and Aitken and these methods. Uh, uh, any questions on um, of general interest of like programming assignments or something? Any more problems this week? Maybe more, many of you have not quite get started, but as I always say, you, 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 uh, it's coming closer, the programming assignment, so get started with it soon. You, I said last time you can do it now. There, you know everything you need to do, no issues. It's just MATLAB programming. Just get started. There are, there are some details, and um, uh, it can take quite some time to debug things, so start early. Anyway, let's just r recap everything about Newton. You knew meth Newton's method before. Writing a MATLAB implementation is not even very interesting. In fact, you should write your own usually when you need it. This function doesn't help you much. It's really just one line. The new p is equal to the old p minus f of the old p minus f prime of the old p, right? And you remember that, and you can do a lot of stuff. Um, in terms of theory, the key thing was to observe that this is really fixed point iteration. Remember, we didn't derive it as such. We derived it with all these tangents and stuff. But if you look at it, it's exactly fixed point iteration with this particular uh, g of x. And we try to understand why that is a good thing. And we spend a lot of time proving this theorem which I said is in a way success of the method. It proves that Newton converges. It's kind of what you want. Uh, however, it's not constructive because it says that you have to be close to P within delta, and nobody tells you what delta is. So it's one of those funky things where at least you know it works for some delta, but it's not practical. Uh, anyway, how did we prove that? Uh, we went through some efforts, but basically we used the fact that it's a fixed point and the theorem from before. We just have to prove all those things that you proved for your sample problems for fixed point map to itself, derivative small enough, et cetera. And there were some more abstract arguments about that, but, but really it, it can be shown to be done. We're going to do a little bit more analysis now. Uh, but before then, we talked about something called the secant method, addressing one of the issues with Newton, namely that what if you don't have the derivative? If you don't have the derivative, uh, clearly you can't do Newton because there's an f prime in the, in the, de uh, uh, in the denominator, right? So the idea here is not necessarily a very good one, but if you have two different p's, and they are, to begin with, initial values, you need p0 and p1 to get started, OK? Then, of course, you can draw a straight line between those f's. And I drew a figure last time. And that would be your line instead of Newton. Or if you wish, uh, you can say that uh, the, the line between those two points approximates the derivative. That's something you can do. Uh, completely straightforward, the, the final formula is called the secant method, and here it is. I had a problem where you're going to try it out. Theory-wise, you can say a few things. Uh, it's not quite as good as Newton. But you know, if you really don't have the derivative, it could be worth doing. Um, I also mentioned this method. I don't think I assigned any problems on it. So it's not going to be part of what we do. It's, not, uh, it's, it's a variant trying to solve similar things as you're going to do in programming assignment one. So let's forget about regular falsy for now. But I think regular falsy is what most of these calculator type solvers are doing. Um, here's an important concept now. Uh, that we started talking about last time, and we'll continue now. The order of convergence, not to be mixed up with rate of convergence, but it's, of course, trying to address the same thing, namely, how quickly does a series converge to its limit? So you have a, a, a sequence. So you have a sequence Pn, and it converges to P, just like before. Here's a question. What's the, if you look at how far you are, you know, I used that term a lot before. How far am I from the limit, right? That's Pn plus 1 minus P absolute, right? So I, you could call it error. There are many things to call it. But you see what this thing is doing here. If alpha is equal to 1, uh, what I'm essentially saying is that Pn minus P is equal to something. But then I take a step, and I get closer if lambda is less than 1. So that's the whole idea, that you should be able to, uh, and that's what we call linear convergence, when alpha is equal to 1. That at first, Pn minus P is, is a number, and then you take a step, and it's half of that, or half of that, or half of that, right? Linear convergence. And it could be 1 tenth. It could be anything. That would be lambda. Greater than 1 would not imply convergence, actually. Uh, but we want to do something more. This is actually, Newton is much, much better than this. It's not even, it, it, it's just fundamentally better. It's not just that it has a small alpha. 
it's fundamentally better in that it brings up this alpha, sorry, it doesn't have a small lambda only, it has a alpha equals to two, which is something we call quadratic convergence. And the definition is clear, so in a way, if you're confused about this, just follow the definition, like in math usually, there is a definition, right? So two example problems I showed last time were the following two, and they are maybe a little too simple, but just we can do the arithmetic pretty quickly. Here's just a series I made up that is linear convergence. Pn plus one is equal to Pn plus one half, okay? Now, I said last time that uh, if it has a limit, it has to be a solution to the equation P equals P plus one half. You take limits of both sides. Uh, similar to you did in the Fibonacci example in the homework. So that limit could be one, okay? I didn't prove that it converges to that. But if it does, then this is going to happen. You just plug into the definition, the limit of Pn plus one minus one divided by Pn minus one to some power alpha. And you do the, you just do the simplification and you figure out that you can make this limit exist equal to one half if you set alpha equals to one. And that's linear convergence, right? So that's the turn the crank type approach to figuring out the order of convergence for an explicit uh, sequence like this. And it's not too bad, it's gonna approach one. It will converge to one if you're close enough. We didn't address that, but, but it will. Uh, so that's fine. And it will do so by just intuitively dividing the error the, by, by half, right? So it's, it's kind of by, like by section. So it's okay, it's not that fast. Uh, fundamentally different was this sequence, which is, uh, you know, whatever different it is. Uh, again, uh, actually there are many possible um, fix, uh, sorry, limits now to this sequence depending on where you start. I was actually lucky because there's a root at 1.5, I think. But I think in my MATLAB I started at 1.3. Uh, anyway, you just plug in and do exactly the same thing. And I had to do some more simplification here. And it turned out that now I can actually, and, and just a point, I could of course still set alpha equals to one, and I'm just dividing by a smaller power of zero as you go to, go to the limit. But I could set alpha to two and bring a limit, uh, a finite limit out of this. That's great. You wanna choose the highest possible alpha. This quadratic convergence is just fundamentally different. And when we try it in MATLAB, it really, it really you could really see uh, I want to do format long and I want and format compact as well so we can see things. But basically, if I started at 1.5 uh, and did this iteration here, p plus one half, you could see that it really divides the error or the distance from the limit by two every time, right? Which is, again, okay. It will converge, right? It's not so okay if that half was 0 0.999 and it would take forever. It will still converge though, but it's, you know, that's what it is. Uh, let's do the other one, and I think uh, 1.5 didn't work. Let's try 1.3. Uh, so p is equal to two times p squared uh, minus four times p plus three. And, you know, I was lucky it went in the right direction here, but, uh, you know, it starts off very similarly, kind of dividing that error by half. And that can be told from the very simple reason that dividing by an extra power here, what does it mean? Well, when you're far away, this is kind of a pretty big number, and, and taking the square of it might actually do the opposite bad. So it also shows that quadratic convergence can be really bad if you're far away. But the idea is that when you're really close to one, this is a small number. And not only do you now multiply something by a factor of, well, it, in this case, this number is greater than one, but it doesn't matter because it's really times the square of the error before. So if this is 10 to the minus three, what will this be? A proc, it's a limit, but a pro suppose the limit was exact. If, 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 you're, if you're at 1.001, you can see that next time you're gonna be at 10, one plus 10 to the minus six because you're squaring the difference. You're squaring the, the, the distance away from the limit, right? That's, that creates a fundamentally different uh, convergence. Look at MATLAB here. We don't quite see it yet, but now of course something happened. It divided by eight in one step, okay? But now it's a huge difference. It's eight, ti eight times uh, 10 to the minus three and it, in one step, you know, <laughs> Then it's divided by 80. And now I'm saying it's gonna be kind of like eight digits here. It went from 0, 0, 0, 0001 to 0, 0, 0002, like, you know, 10 to the minus eight something. <laughs> Pretty amazing. And, uh, and, and I mean, are you into, this is just something I made up, but the big point here is that Newton is doing exactly this. So these are just writing up explicit examples of what we're trying to understand. And it's just a fundamental difference um, between these types of convergence. And we have names for it, linear and quadratic convergence. And of course, I'm sure I can make up an example with cubic, if you wish. Uh, here are the main theorems. Uh, I'll address them just quickly. Uh, so so the, the punchline here will be that Newton is quadratic convergent if under the right circumstances. The first theorem is a negative one. You can see the word only. It says that if you don't have a 
everything like before, but if you, if you, so these are the same conditions as in fixed point. But if you don't have a zero derivative at the fixed point of the G, you do not have more than linear convergence, okay? So we already knew, we proved that it converted, it has a fixed point, it will convert. And I'm telling you, look, it's not gonna be quadratic if that derivative is not zero. Quick proof, I started here to save some time. Uh, so basically I summarized the whole theorem, but it's the one on the top there. Only linear convergence if, if the derivative is not zero. How do we show that? Again, I know you're sick and tired of the mean value theorem, but that's how we do all these things with fixed point iteration, because of the trick that we can replace PM plus one by the definition of fixed point iteration, it comes from applying G on PM. This is the definition of fixed point iteration. PM plus one equals G, uh, G of PM. Uh, and we can always play the game of the actual fixed point and replacing that by just G of P because that's the definition of the fixed point. It has come in sooner or later, right? <laughs> and then you do mean value theorem on that. You did some sort of xi, and I put an N on the xi because this xi is different all the time, right? In this case, it's not a big problem though because I'm gonna take a limit here. And what's good about the xi is the limit as n goes to infinity. It doesn't go to zero, it goes to, I squeeze it in. What is xi between? Uh, it has to be between uh, these two values, right? P and PM. But since we proved that it converges, PM is gonna go to P. So in the limit, xi has to be between uh, numbers that converge to each other. So, so xi n has to go to P. That's the good thing. So you can sometimes, if you, if you do uh, you know, the xi trick and the interval shrinks, the good news is that xi is also gonna have to go to that limit. So anyway, so this leads simply, uh, simply to, now we just plug into that definition again. M plus, n plus one minus one divided by P n minus one. I'm not even gonna take to the power of alpha because I'm trying to prove that it's linear convergence. So I'm just setting alpha to one and I'll show you that this works. And forget about the absolute values for now. So n is going to infinity. This is going to be the limit as n goes to infinity of this, g prime of xi of n, because of that little mean value uh, theorem trick. And as I mentioned, this xi has to go to p, because as pn gets closer and closer, the xi gets closer and closer to p. So this limit has to be g prime of p. And this is non-zero. And I think I, uh, uh, well, just commenting here. This means that alpha is equal to one linear convergence. So it, I did a, almost exactly the same thing as in this simple example here. It's just that it was a little bit more abstract. Here I got an actual number out of it. But here I had to use the mean value theorem and the conditions in the theorem to argue that this to the power of one, alpha is equal to one, really has a finite but non-zero limit, okay? You have an exercise to show why is this not quadratic? Well, you can kind of see that if this limit with the power of one uh, is non-zero, if I divide by more, let's say alpha equals to two here, this is going to zero, right? That limit is gonna go to infinity for sure. My only way of hope here of getting quadratic convergence was if this was equal to zero. So that's basically what's going on. The second theorem makes it precise. It's a positive theorem saying that you do have quadratic convergence if that derivative is equal to zero. Okay, in order to do that, you actually need to also bound the second derivative. And there are many ways to show that, but you know, most functions you look at, if we make up simple examples, you have to bound the second derivative, but it's, it's needed technically to, to get this to work out. Um, let's see, that can be shown quite easily with a, with a, but let's wait with that for now and see some, look at some examples. So basically, uh, this is not Newton, right? It's just saying so far that, it's just saying so far that, uh, that you know, if you have g prime p is equal to zero, uh, it's gonna quadrat uh, convert quadratically. There is again a delta, same as in Newton, we don't know what the delta is, but you know, at some point it's gonna start converting quadratically, right? It can't be better than what we did before when we just had Newton converges. But now it's saying that if everything is right and you have this bounded derivative, it's, it's gonna quadrat uh, convert, quad uh, convert quadratically. That's the plan. Uh, now, now, now here's a funky little trick that we can do. Going back to Newton, I think we said already before when we proved uh, that Newton converges, when we proved this here, we did find the fact that indeed g of p is equal to zero for Newton, okay? But actually, you can turn this whole thing around and say that the theorems here don't talk about Newton. They talk about fixed point iteration and a very simple condition. Well, there are all, all these complicated uh, uh, conditions from before, but it's this condition. This is bad, it's linear. If you set it to zero, it's quadratic. So the question is, Forgetting about Newton, could we derive a method, a new, a new Newton's method, 
here's what you can do. Uh, you can say, let's look for a fixed point iteration of the form gx equals x minus something, depending on x, maybe, times n, right? Why, why this form? Because we talked about it all the time. This is the way you can transfer a root problem, f of x equals 0 to a fixed point, right? We just don't know what phi to choose. Now we have a mechanism for choosing the phi. It's very simple. g prime should be 0 at p. Plug it in, you get a differentiate, uh, you get an expression out, and you plug in p, you get, you get actually a 0 out. So it really shows very simply that this phi has to be 1 over f prime of p. OK? Is that a big surprise or not? Well, plug it in, and that is what Newton is doing. So it's just uh, kind of nice to see that in a completely different way, without tangents and Taylor or anything, we reach, well, there is a Taylor kind of in the proof of this, but, but it, it leads to the same method. So in a way, it shows that Newton is the optimal, within this class of methods, it's kind of the optimal choice. You can do more than that, but it's, it's really a quite magical choice, phi equals 1 over f prime of p. I tried to be pedagogical uh, like two lectures ago when I played around with fixed points, and I varied that phi manually. And I did minus 1, I did plus 3, and stuff like that. And you can see sometimes it doesn't converge, and sometimes it converges better. Here is obviously the best choice because of the theory we have. So, you know, whether this is, whether you need this derivation or not can be discussed, but it, it's nice. It, it really shows how the theory fits together. Um, let me show you an example of, um, we, we, we've done so many Newtons, so, so it's not that interesting any longer. What more can go wrong? What can go wrong here? Right? We kind of spell it out all the time, right? Uh, we talked about this, um, well, we talked about it already when we proved the Newton theorem. What was the condition here that was kind of a little bit weird? The delta, I have already said all the excuses for. Namely, it's, it's sad that we don't know what it is. I'm not going to fix that for you. <laughs> it's it's going to be that bad. Uh, here's a condition we talked about last time that is kind of weird. Why do we insist that f prime of p is equal to 0? And if you remember when the proof, I mean, one very simple reason why you realize that f prime cannot be 0 is in the original derivation of Newton. It's a slope. You're dividing by it, right? Look at it, f over f prime. Although it could be discussed, like we said last time, that maybe you won't exactly plug in p. It's too risky. You cannot allow f prime to blow up in the, where you are iterating. You would, you would, uh, this g goes to infinity, basically, right? Well, not quite, because you know, f is also going to 0 at that point. But it's just not a good situation. Uh, and we use that condition in the proof. So is this bad? What does it mean to have f0 and f prime of 0? The way we draw these zeros are always uh, such that there is not a f prime equals 0. Just a typical way for me to draw a 0 is to do this, right? You know, It's like a nice crossing from a negative to positive values or the other way around. And it's a clear non-zero derivative, right? So what I'm talking about is, is the scenario that you bring this guy up there or that you do this, right? Apparently, that's bad. And unfortunately, uh, quite often, there are many problems where you want to do that. Oops. So we've um, got to think about that. We've got to see what we can do about it. Um, I, I can come up with a simple example. And last time I did x squared. Um, let's do x squared just to see how bad it is. It's the simplest case of, of, of doing that. f of x equals x squared f prime of x equals 2x. Newton is pn plus 1 equals pn minus um, pn squared over 2pn. And if you want to, since it's such a simple equation, you can actually simplify that and see that it's really just pn half. OK? pn plus 1 equals pn half. That's what Newton will do to this equation. So you see that we ended up not quite dividing by 0 just because we have a higher power up here. So it's actually not, it doesn't look that bad. It kind of works out. What order of convergence is this? It's linear, right? It's, it's really the typical example of linear. That uh, if you start at 1, remember the solution is 0. It's, a, these simple, it's too simple, but we're going to do it. The solution is 0. Uh, if you start at 1, next step you're going to get to half, then a quarter, then an eighth, right? You're dividing by 2 every time. That sounds good to you, but it's just linear convergence. And it's just something went wrong, because Newton should be much better than that. Uh, just a little bit of a reminder from algebra. Um, what we're talking about here is that we have a 0 with higher multiplicity. 
you all know from algebra that uh, if f of x has a root, you can pull out the x minus p, uh, if it has a root at p, and get a q of x remaining. Um, but the idea of now is that you can actually pull out another factor of x minus p. And in general, if you have a multiplicity m, you can pull out m of those factors, and left is a q that does not, not have a 0. So the nice case here is what we call a simple 0, where you can pull out one factor, uh, x minus p, with an m equals 1, and then you get a q of x here that has a limit that is not equal to 0. Okay? And it can be shown just with a one-liner uh, that um, that actually means exactly what we're talking about, namely that you have a derivative that is not 0. Okay? But it's if and only if. So if you have a derivative at 0, it means that you have a small uh, uh, multiplicity of the root, right? So in this case, it's very simple. It's a polynomial, and it's all clear. You know that it, it's almost too simple. I should, I should do it so the root was 1 instead. But you all see that it has a 0 at 1, uh, but you can also pull out 2. So, so there is a factor x minus 0 in here, obviously, right? But guess what? There are two of them, which means that it has a multiplicity 0 and multiplicity 2. Another way to see it is derivative is also equal to 0 at the root. So that's bad. Um, Actually, a nice theorem you might not have seen is that this really just generalizes that if you want multiplicity 3, you can go up to the second derivative and it's also equal to 0. You might have seen that before. All right, so this is a problem. Uh, um, you know, you need to know about it, and maybe you know that your problem has this issue. Typical case when this happens, what happens? Uh, what is a typical situation when you have this uh, issue with the... Uh, that it goes down and gets a zero derivative. It happens a lot when you want to minimize some expression that has a zero, and you want to actually, uh, it's, but it's always positive. So you, you want to, you have an error, or something, you, you're measuring an error in something. You want to figure out where the error is as small as possible. Or you want to solve where it's equal to zero, but for whatever reason, the way you formulate it, it goes down and touches. So my, I'm trying to say a number, a, a smooth function that has a zero, but it's always positive, clearly cannot do the nice crossing and go down to negative. So it has to go down smoothly and get a zero derivative and up. So these problems show up in practice a lot when people try to look at things that are always positive. Often it's, it's for example, least square type problems where you have a square or something, just like in my example. But it could be really complicated, so it's not obvious that it's going on. But just intuitively, if the function is always positive for some reason that you construct it, and you want to find the zero, that's a bad situation, right? Uh, for this reason. Anyway, there's a way to fix it with Newton. It's not often done, but I think it's nice that the book mentions it. You should know about it. In practice, people try to reformulate and avoid this problem. But here's a nice trick. It's, it's described in one slide. Uh, let me show you what's going on here. Um, so if you know this situation happens, there's, there, there's things you can do. And, and, and this is what you do. Um, you define a new function, mu, where you kind of divide away the derivative from f. Okay, and um, so you can think about what's going on here, but, uh, but, but if you do a little bit of, of the algebra here, you can see that this mu can be written in a form such that first of all, mu is equal to zero when f is equal to zero. Okay, that's clear, right? If you're plugging in f of, uh, of the zero there, you, you're getting a, uh, uh, the, the numerator here is zero as well. But the good news is that uh, when, you, when you're plugging in the zero, uh, let's see, I'm going too fast here. You rewrite mu where you pull out one term of x minus p, and you get the rest here by simply differentiating the f. Then you show that when you're plugging in p, you get a non-zero coming out of it, showing that this p is not a multiple zero of that mu. So apparently dividing f by f prime of p, f prime of x, creates a new function that has the zero, but with only multiplicity one. And that's exactly what Newton likes. So, so it's a trick. Uh, what we do now is, of course, run Newton on this complicated mu instead. And it's unfortunately a uh, quotient. You have to use the, uh, the rule for that. It's a little bit more complicated, but it's not that hard. And in fact, you can pre-do it and get this expression here at the bottom. You can imagine, you see it's exactly Newton, except that the, except that the derivative f prime became something different, and it clearly comes straight from just uh, using the quotient rule on this, on this mu that you defined up here. So it's, it's a little funky, and it's, it's a trick. The way you remember it is either the whole expression or just saying that the trick is just divide by f prime and run Newton on that. 
okay? And then apparently, since we just showed that it's a simple root, things are going to be fine, okay? Now, since we divide by the derivative in the function itself, clearly we're going to get second derivatives coming out, right? Because Newton wants to differentiate as well. And indeed, there's a second derivative there. So that's a drawback. You've got to know the second one. Okay? But how about, uh, do you want to try to do that here? I want to warn you that it gets very boring. It's too good. But it's equal to 2. So I would say that the modified Newton, by the way, this is not really what people call a lot of things modified Newton. But to you, it's going to be clear what I mean. It says that Pn plus 1 is now Pn minus. Well, you have to use this formula. So it's x squared, pn squared, times the first derivative, which is 2x, 2pn. Then you're dividing by the first derivative squared, which is 4pn squared, minus the function, pn squared, times the second derivative, which is 2. Okay? This is 2pn cubed. This is 2 pn squared, which means that this is really just pn minus 2 pn cubed over 2 pn squared, which is equal to 0. That's kind of nice. It will, uh, apparently, it will solve it in one step. And that's because it's an exact quadratic polynomial. It's not that interesting, actually. So let's make it a little bit more interesting. Uh, just an example that will work. I don't Maybe I'm overlapping your homework here, but a typical trick in order to create this function, and that's also where they come from in reality, is to take something like sine. And you know that it looks very much like x. So it actually has a simple 0 at x equals 0. Uh, you can run Newton on that, and it's going to be great. So let's mess with it. Let's subtract x. <laughs> Why do I know that that will mess things up? Because just by Taylor, now it looks a little bit like x cubed, right? Or actually, minus x cubed sixths is the leading term now. So it should be a little bit of the flavor from before, but not a trivial. So it's not going to be perfect. We'll see if we can fix it. Let's just derive the derivatives. It's cos of x minus 1. And we need the other one if we're going to do this modified. And I'm not even going to write down the Newton's method, but just do it on the computer. OK? So when we do this on the computer, uh, let me just define all these guys. You should be very comfortable with this syntax now soon. So that's the function, right? Then I call the derivative df. And I need a second derivative as well, which is minus sine of x. OK? So I just define all those functions. Let's just confirm that Newton is bad. You start somewhere. I'm not going to run my Newton function. It's too simple. It's easier to just do it by hand here. And um, uh, functions are sometimes useful. But what is Newton doing? p equals p minus f of p divided by. This is what Newton is doing. You know, unless you want the while loop and everything, you know, doing it by hand like this is almost easier. And uh, 0 0.65 doesn't look very good. Um, yeah. You know, you never know with Newton because, as I said, it takes, it's got to get close before it really rushes off to the quadratic. And the theorem said it too. There's a delta that you don't know. So you might have to go for a while. But it's pretty clear to me now that this is linear convergence. And in fact, the lambda is not even a half. It's a little bit more than a half. You see that? OK, so this convinces me that, fine, it's working. But I'm not impressed. Something went wrong. You're trying to solve with this with Newton, and life is, life is bad. So the, the answer is then that you try the other approach. And the other approach said that, again, you could define the mu, but likely in an application, you would just go straight for this formula. So you get f of, uh, f of p times f prime, df of p, then divided by, you know, it's a little messy, minus f of p times ddf of p. OK? So here's that entire modified Newton. I could, of course, write a little MATLAB function called modified Newton. But no, you know how to do that yourself. It's just a different expression. Let's see if it's doing better. Now, the problem is that I forgot to reinitialize p. So this is going to do great. Too good. Don't look. Let's go back to 1. OK? So already the first step seems to do much better than the previous one. Uh, but of course, after that, it's, it's just insane. In fact, yeah. 
Here is basically doubling the number of digits is what we often call the quadratic convergence of Newton. So you have 10 to 10 minus 5 in one step, you get 10 to the minus 11 in the next. Um, that's it. That's, that's how that can solve. So, you know, I, I'm honest in telling you in practice, I don't see this trick being applied that often. People, if they have this situation, they try to reformulate it, taking various, solving some different problems. But, uh, but it's, it's kind of nice that it can be done this way. Um, all right. A little confusing. And again, homework-wise, I'm sure I asked you to do one of these at some point. And maybe it was exactly the example I just showed. Then it's too bad. But uh, then you try something else, maybe. You gotta learn it, that's all it's about. Uh, you, for those of you who started with the homework, you also saw that I talked about something called Aitken's delta square. It's a quite straightforward approach. It's a nice trick. Uh, here's the trick. It, it, it's called an acceleration, or as a way to accelerate something. So you have a linearly convergent sequence. And you wanna use the fact that you know that it's linear to try to make it better. And you can already see it's just one slide. So down here you have the expression. We're going to do stuff, but don't go there yet. Let's just see uh, what, what the steps are. Um, so the, Aitken, the idea behind Aitken is to assume that these, um, uh, if you think about what linear convergence means, it really goes back to the understanding of that multiplying by lambda every time. Uh, it's not exactly what it's doing, but in the limit it is. So isn't it reasonable to say that the ratio between the error at step n plus 1 and n is not too far from the next ratio at n plus 2 and n plus 1. Well, in the limit, they are equal. Okay? So the question is, how close are you as you get there? But as you saw from any example, including my bad Newton here, let's do it here. So my bad Newton was this guy, right? There's a ratio between them. And I looked at it and I said, it's more than a half, actually. Good thing is that it's less than one. So it's going to converge, right? But the, the second number divided by the first is you know, something like 0 0.6 or 7, right? I should have. This is a case when you don't want to overwrite, because now I want to know them. Um, all right, let me show you some fancy MATLAB trick here. Where can I put, if I, if I have P1 and I want to save it, where should I put the next one? Well, you can create an array, and you, MATLAB is actually really fundamentally based on arrays. So the trick here is to keep the one, and there's a position, and the next, you, you create a vector out of this, and you say that, let's put it in the next one. So this is a syntax that starts looking a little bit more like the math notation, right? That the one, you start at P with only one. And then you grab that one, and you produce a number two, and out comes a vector with those two numbers. Okay? Why is that so much better? Well, first of all, I kept it. So that's kind of nice. But how can I generalize this? What if I had an i that was equal to 2 there? And now it's equal to 3. Then it's the new i, the new p there, is the old one applied using Newton's method. Isn't that nice? And now, of course, even better is that I write the whole for loop. Why don't we start from beginning? Two to, let's say, 10 steps. I don't need that many. Yeah, for this one, I need many steps. And then you just do this. And it will pop out an entire vector of Newtons, right? So that, that, these are the kind of things we do. I did not do this in my Newton on the website because I threw away all the numbers. But if you wanted to keep, you just put them in a array like this. I'll start showing you more examples of that. Anyway, what was I trying to show? So we have a bunch of, of uh, PNs here. P, P0, I guess. You know the little issue that MATLAB starts at 1, uh, but this starts at, uh, we start at 0 usually. But anyway, the ratio between these, let's study them. So what is P2 divided by P1? That's the ratio we were talking about before. How about the next one? Not that far away. You know, maybe it's a too simple example, but uh, it really shows that this assumption is reasonable. You know? If you want to see a really fancy MATLAB, why don't we grab all of the ones to the right and divide by all of the ones to the left? Here you have all the ratios for everything I just did. As one simple, this is one of the powers of MATLAB is that you, you don't write loops for these things. You just pretend it's a vector. How many elements in that vector? Only nine, because there are only nine ratios. Ten values, nine ratios. Anyway, my point, or 
I have two points. One is to just demonstrate some new MATLAB stuff. I'll squeeze that in a little bit. But the next was to see that these ratios really do approach a number. Okay? If you know that type, we don't know the number necessarily. Well, we could just compute it by just dividing them. But what can we do if we know it? That's a piece of information that we should be able to use to our advantage. That's Aitken's method. Here's what it's doing. Um, it's saying that these ratios at some point n are very similar. Let's say they are equal. Okay? Now you can multiply around here and um, yeah, that could be useful to see. You want to see where, where things come from. We're not supposed to just pull things out of a hat. Then you give up. I do that. Sometimes we have to do it a lot in this class, saying, just trust us. This works. Um, but what happens if you do that? What happens if you assume that Pn plus 1 minus P over the other one approximately equal to Pn plus 2 minus p and minus plus 1. What happens then? Think about it this way. If you have pn, pn plus 1, and pn plus 2, what can you do with this equation? Um, not exactly what I'm looking for, actually. It's simpler. You already have a recursive relationship for getting all those p's. Let's say that you're running that and you have pm, pm plus 1, and pm plus 2. The only new ingredient is that I'm giving you an equation and pretend this is equal. This is one equation and you have pm, pm plus 1, and pm plus 2. You can solve for p. It's one equation, there's a p in there. This sounds too good to be true, right? It is too good to be true because there's an approximation sign. But it's going to improve. That's the trick. So let's just solve for p. This is just boring, but I guess you multiply things up and you're getting a Pn plus 1. I'm going to mess this up. Let's just do it anyway. Equals, and here we get the Pn plus 2 minus P, and then we get a Pn minus P. Okay? You see that it's all quadratics here, so when we expand this, we get n plus 1 square. We get the P coming in there with an n plus 1, and we get a P square. In the right hand side, we get mixed terms Pn plus 2 Pn. We get a p p n, we get a p n plus 2 times p, and finally a p square. Good news here is it's not a quadratic in p. Don't be confused by all the p n's, they're just numbers. Pretend they are 1, 2, 3. It's not even a quadratic. How do you solve this? Well, collect all the linear terms, right? And divide. No, it's, it's just pretty straightforward algebra. So let's collect everything multiplying p here. There's a pn plus 2 uh, coming from here. I guess I moved that over to the left. Or I guess I kept it on the right. Um, what else am I getting? I'm getting a minus 2pn plus 1. I'm going to write it out, and then we'll see where it comes from. I'm claiming that this is what you get out of it. All the terms multiplying p. On the left, and on the right, everything not multiplying p. And I guess there is still an approximation. Should I do that? If you don't mind, I'll keep it equal. Assume equal for now. OK? You see, it's all wrong, because it was not equal. It was approximate, but I don't want to change. Uh, then this would be equal to pn plus 2 pn minus pn plus 1 square. That's it. It's the right hand side. That's a number. There's something multiplying p. And you divide it down, and you get the end result, right? So, so you know, it's, it's really just an equation for p if it's true that those, those ratios are equal. What? Well, it's iffy. It might not be true. But, but the limit is the motivation. Because the definition of first order convergence is this, right? Th this is the limit of the first order convergence. That you take a step, pn plus 1 minus p over pn minus p to the 1, which is the ratio, goes towards a number lambda, right? And by all the definitions from math 1a about uh, limits and everything, it means that you know, when n is large enough, you should be pretty close to lambda for all 
n. So that means that both n plus 1 and n plus 2 and all of them are going to. So, so you know, they approach that number. Now, if this is going to happen before then, it's, it's, it's really, you'll see that it's not that certain. Uh, anyway, so the final expression is this, p equal to uh, pn plus 2 times pn minus pn plus 1 square over pn plus 1 minus 2 pn plus 1. I think there's a 2 there plus pn. So this is what you get out of it. And for reasons that will become clear in a bit, you want to simplify it a little bit to take out the pn like that. You see it as a correction to pn. You have a pn and you want to, there's something that's going to change about it. And it's a quite simple form, a square of a difference and what we call a second difference, which is this here. PN. But this is the whole formula, right? But anyway, I don't want to, I really just want to want to focus on the important part, namely that with this assumption, if you run your PN series, you can locally solve for these P's. They may or may not be better. Okay? So that's the idea. So, you know, the idea here is that you can, you know, call this a new sequence. You have, uh, for whatever numbers you have, you can have your PN for a bunch of Ns. And what can you do with this? So you're getting these numbers here, right? What can I do to compute this? Let's say we define this to be some new sequence PN hat. Okay? That means in order to do this, I need three numbers, right? So I, I need to, I start somewhere, I have that number. I need to actually compute one and compute the next. Now I can compute uh, this guy here, pn hat, right? And then of course, if you compute one more, that allows you to compute this guy here. Is it better than this guy here? Maybe, maybe not. But it's certainly a, a, a different way to compute these um, differences. Do we have something linear? Actually, this. This is great. Here's a linearly convergent series, we think. And uh, we want to see if this trick works. So what it's saying is that when you have the first three numbers, I have 10 numbers. Maybe it's confusing for you guys. But let's just pretend you have the first three numbers. Can you use 1, 0 0.65, and 0 0.43? to obtain a better estimate. Well, what the estimate is saying is that. So it's basically saying that, let's say n is equal to 1, and then you plug it in. You can double check that I'm getting this right. Square, and then you have to divide by p3 minus 2p2 plus p1. And you know, if this is impressive or not, I don't know. But I started with 1, 0 0.65 and 0 0.43. Using those three numbers, it says that, hey, a better estimate is 0 0.035. And to you, it's all looking like I'm just computing numbers that go to 0. This seems easy. But remember, you can move this equation to something non-trivial. It's because I chose two simple equations. Right? It really went from an error of uh, you know, 0 0.43 down to an error of 0 0.035. That's pretty amazing. Let's do it on the next one. Then you have to move this number up. And of course, this. So when you, when you have three, when you have two, three, four, you can do this trick. And uh, you know, it, it's it doesn't look like Newton, but it's, at least it's really much much better than the numbers you had before. So this is the idea. This is what this method is doing. Uh, very good question, you, you're, you're, and you're predicting the future here. Uh, I cannot just magically start messing with these two, because then the ratios are very different. This, this behaves in a way that we haven't analyzed, and it's just much better, but we don't know. All we know is really that these ratios are good. So yeah, you don't want to throw this guy in suddenly. But of course, there's going to be a coming up a method very soon called Stephenson's method, Stephenson's method, where it says that, look, you take three steps. You compute this guy. Uh, you, suppose you're standing there, and you did a lot of work to do these steps. Actually, you just took two steps, because you started here, right? You have this guy. What should you do next? 
So what I suggested here was that you compute another inaccurate guy here in order to predict this guy here. Stephenson says, no, 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 forget about all this. If you have something here that you like better, so much better, restart. That's all. That's Stephenson's method. So that goes back to why, why are we not using, so that's going to be the next algorithm. Uh, I guess Aitken should be seen in its simplicity. I mean, it's a really simple method, right? It's really just, you know, this is the entire derivation, just solving for that p. And if you have some magic linear sequence somewhere, it can be improved using this technique. Uh, if you want to see a fancy MATLAB, why don't we do it to all of them? So I would say that all except the last two, and you can think about why I'm skipping the last two, but if I have 10 numbers and you need three to make a prediction, I can only make eight predictions, right? Very similar to what I said before, I can only have nine ratios out of 10 numbers, right? So, so I'm going to have to cut out the last two, and here I'm going to have to do uh, the last uh, middle ones. A little cryptic. Don't worry if this is freaking you out. But uh, why do I do dots power? It's not good. So MATLAB has this thing, right? People got away with just a power because it was scalar. When you work with many numbers at the same time, like vectors and matrices, MATLAB needs all these dots. Not for minus and plus because they are uniquely defined. But, uh, but they, they have this issue of defining it. So I also need dot slash here. All right, almost done. So this is, comes to a point when you should probably start writing scripts. I strongly recommend you put things in M files instead of just playing around like this. Because you make mistakes, you mess it up, you can't run it again. Okay? So don't do what I'm doing in that sense. All right, what happened here? I, I, took, I got eight numbers out, right? These are the outputs. That, these are actually really the P and hats there for that example. So here are the P's, and there are the P and hats. Are they better? Well, this number here we already computed before. Came from the first three, and this here. Let's look at the last one, you know. It did much better. So it's really improved a linear sequence. Now, unfortunately, it didn't really make it Newton, because we remember Newton is just take five iteration and everything is done. So it just improved it somehow. And that comes from this thing that we're not reusing our PN hats in a good way. But it's a nice trick. It's so simple. Uh, so uh, before we go to the, to, to the Stephenson, let's just talk about a notation. So now it's no math at all. It's just a notation. It's going to come up a lot in just a few weeks. Uh, and it's a, it's a delta notation. Uh, we call it the forward difference. OK? So uh, I'm just saying if you have a sequence of number, I'm defining that you can create a new sequence of numbers that we call delta of the, free, of the previous one. And it's defined to be the differences. And the reason for that is that we these differences here. Uh, so let's see how we can define deltas of higher order. So they're just recursively defined. So delta of 1, let's see, we have the definition is there. How about the next one? Uh, so basically, they define the delta of a pn to be pn plus 1, 1 minus pn, OK? Now, they also say that if you want to do higher powers, we also define what it means to do delta square, et cetera, but let's say k. And we do it by this completely recursive approach of saying uh, that you define it to be the delta applied to the previous one. You see that this will tell you a lot of different new sequences? And it's kind of a discrete analog of derivatives. Um, let's do. For example, delta, so this is the definition. That's all you need. But delta square of pn would by this be equal to the delta of delta pn, right? Plug in the definition. It says that it's the delta of that. All right, now you've got to apply the delta, the definition again, right? So the delta of Pn plus 1 minus delta of Pn is really Pn plus 2 minus Pn plus 1. Minus Pn plus 1 plus Pn. This is delta square of the sequence Pn. And of course, we like to write it Pn plus 2 minus 2 Pn plus 1 plus Pn. Right? It's just a notation, nothing new at all. <laughs> But we'll be using it a lot. And you can keep on computing higher orders, of course. Why did I do that? 
make this easier to remember. And they will show up a lot in the future. This is the first difference. This is a delta of pm. This here is the second difference. So it means that we can write the entire Aitken method in this new notation. Okay? I didn't really do much, but it will come back later. So you might want to get used to that notation. What can we say theoretically? I'm not going to go through any proofs of this, but um, it, there's a vague statement saying that it's better than before. Uh, it's not quadratic. It's not necessarily doing that much better. All it's saying is that the P, these pn hats go to p quicker than pn in exactly this sense. And it's quite nice. It's not that just that they stay 10 times better all the time. They really get better and better, and it approaches 0. They said it's somewhere between Newton and, and the sequence you had before. But uh, I think the main point also that I'm having you do in the homework problem is, is, is this Stephenson's method, which is so easy to describe, but the notation is crazy. So let's go back to exactly what I said. It's just a question of the order here. You, you take your linear method, and you take two steps, right? Then you have three numbers, and Aitken allows you to produce a p0 hat out of it. OK? The way I describe it is not smart, because all these numbers are just so bad. So why would you keep on going? And the idea is simply just throw them away, start here, and now you compute two new values here and eight can again, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. OK, now let's look at the messy notation in the slides. All right, so eight can, here's the stupid method. It would say that there is really a p series and a p hat series, right? So the p series would start with a p0, that's your initial guess, and p1 is g of p0. This is easy. P2 is G. This is really just uh, the normal. Uh, and, and if you, if you just, uh, it's, it's written here in a chronological order in the way you would do it. Because now you have three numbers, P0, P1, and P2. Hey, let's do eight scan, right? And that's a P0 square. And, and also, did I introduce this at the previous slide? Actually, I didn't introduce this name. This is, a, this is another shorthand for eight scan, braces a delta square. But anyway, so you apply eight scan to get P0 half. Then what? What's the next step? If, we don't, if we're not smarter, all we can do is to do a P3, that is G of P2, and we get a new P1 hat, etc. This is what I wrote there, and it's exactly here. Stephenson says the following, and now the notation is messy. I'm following the book because they're doing superscripts here because there's going to be an iteration number. But in words, you have a P0, you make a P1, you make a P2. No difference. You predict a P hat, right? No difference from before. But if you allow me to now call this a new P0, OK? And by new, I mean that I have a superscript that I now bounced up to 1. And then you keep on going. So you know, notation is one thing, but in words, it's quite, straight, quite straightforward what I'm doing, right? That's it. Um, we can look at the MATLAB code. Maybe that's the clearest. Some, some people think the code is the best way to describe something. Uh, it's really just like fixed-point iteration. Let's improve fixed-point iteration. Remember, by the way, that these are not really assuming that, that it's fixed-point iteration. It's just saying some linear sequence. But you have a G and initial. These are exactly the same inputs that we had for fixed point. But we're going to do better. So what we do, uh, this is exactly what we did for fixed point. We took a step, right? We, we made an iteration with fixed point. But we're going to need to make one more step using that. So what do we have now? The first iteration, we have P0, P1, P2, right? Nothing strange. Now you do Aitken on these numbers. This is the Aitken that we did several times before. You, you just uh, apply Aitken. And I call it P and not P hat. Be careful. I, I warned you about my MATLAB notation. P in math is almost always the, the true limit, the value we're trying to solve for, right? In my MATLAB code, usually not. Uh, I don't like hats and stuff here. But you could rewrite it if you want to. Uh, and that's it. Now, how do, you, how do you iterate? If you're not done, if you're done, you're done. What if you're not done? P0 equals P. It's, it's really what I said in words. Forget everything from before. Take your last new Aitken update, the hat, and keep on going. Quite straightforward, right? You don't even need this function for, for doing it. So I guess in principle, uh, what is a good test case? You know how I like to keep it simple. And now we call it Gs, right? So this was my first fixed point example. And we noticed that starting at 1, 
it wasn't uh, uh, did I have a tolerance to no yeah maybe I had oh number of iterations sorry uh, so this was uh, what it did back then right now unfortunately did I write the Stephenson table yes great <laughs> okay yeah, well, exactly the same thing, but Stephenson. So let me clean this up. Here is fixed point, let's say uh, seven iterations. And now we just do Stephenson. Stephenson. Is it better? Oh, it didn't even do seven because it, it stopped early. Why did it stop early? Well, we could look at the code for that. Anyway, let's look at this. What's happened? Um, well, you won't even be able to match numbers, but in, in words, it's taking the one that I gave it and the 0 0.54 and 85. And it's applying that, and apparently the result is 0 0.728. Okay? And that's pretty good. It's not that amazing, though. But as you keep on going, you see that it gets pretty amazing. And it's like Newton. It's really quadratic convergence. Uh, it looks like quadratic convergence. It uh, can be discussed. If it, it, it's usually not, actually. But it's so much better. So this is an alternative way to doing a better solver. And it's good to know. That Newton is, you know, not the only thing. Uh, what's good about this compared to Newton? That's well, in the first derivative, right? The second was for this other messy. Oh, yeah. yeah, you don't need derivatives. There are no derivatives here, really. Uh, bad things, or it's actually kind of a nice method. The, there is a theorem here uh, that under the right circumstances you can get essentially a quadratic convergence. So it's it it reminds you of Newton. It's a different way to do. It. Actually, not, not that sure why. I think the reason is that it doesn't extend so nice to multidimensional systems. But as presented here, it's quite an amazing method. All right? This is everything I was supposed to cover last Tuesday. <laughs> and everything you're supposed to know uh, for the homework for next Tuesday. Is it a lot of stuff? Going too fast? Too slow? Too few proofs? Too many proofs? It is pretty fast, I know. I'm sorry about that. Sometimes it will go slower. You know, I was hoping to do MATLAB demos and stuff. I don't have time for that. But, uh, you know, sections are for that, and, and you, can, you can also study those things on your own. Having said that, I think it's going to be quite straightforward to do these examples. Uh, the examples are silly. It's mostly numericals. You do it with, a comp with MATLAB or with a calculator. But you will learn the method, OK? And on an exam, I could give you a simple, uh, simple question, like, you know, just run steps on, on these numbers. And, it's very difficult to choose numbers that are such that you can do it easily by hand without a calculator. But I've done it before, so that works out. But the understanding is a bigger thing. Uh, namely, you know, what was the main trick of, of why, what did we do here? We start with the linear. There are various ways to get to these sequences. And uh, it's a nice field. There's a last section of this chapter, uh, 2.6, uh, that really just addresses one particular function. What, are there any restrictions on the Fs or Gs that we've talked about? I mean, we do have restrictions. For example, you know, three times continuous or differentiable, apparently, for Stephenson. Uh, you know, we have all types of condition on the function. But I haven't really told you anything about what the function is. You could plug in almost anything, right, as long as it behaves well. Uh, let's, if you start thinking about a particular class of functions, you can do much better. And one particular function, class of functions that people like a lot are polynomials, right? They just show up in applications all the time. People have a huge need of solving for roots of polynomials. So let's see if we can do something smart about that. Um, just a little bit of theory about polynomials. What is a polynomial? This, I hope, is reviewed to everybody. We call it degree n if it has the form that it's n plus 1 different monomials, where a monomial is x to a power and coefficients in front of it. And of course, the highest non-zero coefficient, that would be the degree. So this is a degree n polynomial. Um, remember your fundamental theorem of algebra, basically saying that um, you can pull out one term of the form x minus a root from this polynomial if it has degree 1 or more. And uh, you know it might be complex. That's an issue. It's kind of a new phenomenon that doesn't show up that will uh, that you start. Everything is real, and suddenly complex numbers start showing up. And you know, just think of the quadratic formula. You know that the thing under the square root can go negative, right? So that's not a big, uh, a big shocker. Now, here's, here's what that leads to. If it has a root, you can divide it out. 
You remember long division with polynomials? So basically, if I'm telling you that you're plugging in x uh, a root that you just found, let's call it x1, that means you can divide it out. OK? And basically, what you, what you, what you get out of that is, uh, is uh, it's a polynomial of one degree less. OK? And no remainder, because it was a root. So recursively keep on doing this means leads to this corollary that any polynomial can be factored. OK? And there might be leading coefficient am. There is a leading coefficient am. But apart from that, you have all these first order terms, x minus a root. And they could be to various powers. And of course, you all know that we talked about this before. These are the multiplicities of those roots. OK? Here's a corollary you might not have seen that comes from this, that if you have two de degrees, two polynomials of degree n or le less, if they agree at more than n points, they have to be the same polynomial. And the way I think you see this is that if I tell you two points, you know that there's a unique straight line between them, right? If I give you three points, what's the unique thing between them? Parabola, right? And it's a quadratic. How do, you, how do you think about that? Well, a quadratic is three unknowns. ax squared plus bx plus c, right? If I give you three points, you, you can solve it. These are things you probably have done, right? So, so that's basically what this corollary is saying. That the polynomial is unique if you, t if you tell me. It's kind of nice. I mean, polynomials can look crazy. But if it's degree seven, and you give me just eight numbers of your choice, it's completely specified. Well, it, it shouldn't be a big surprise, because it's just eight numbers in the polynomial that defines it. But, but it, it's something we'll be using. All right, so what do we want to do with these? Uh, we want to do a few things. But, but here's a trick you might not have seen that is actually just calculate. It, it, it used to be really important. Now computers. This field is changing in the sense that it used to be, I mean, before computers, this was really important. This is just a really clever trick to quickly evaluate polynomials. Uh, now, of course, we have computers. It's still interesting to do it as fast as possible because there are computers evaluating you know, billions of polynomials per second all the time. And if you speed that up by a factor of two, that might be important. Uh, although it really sounds like an, a trick that most people don't pick up nowadays. This is a way to do a few things. Uh, the, the first thing it does is evaluate the polynomial. How do you evaluate the polynomial? Uh, if, if you think about it, I think you would do the following. You, so I give, you, I give you a polynomial, OK? So there are a bunch of coefficients, n plus 1, right? a0, a1, a2. There's also an x. What would you do? My guess is you would do a0, and then you would multiply a1 and x, and you would add that. That's a great start, actually. I'm not going to argue with that. If it was just first order, that's kind of the best you can do. Then what? Then you, do, then you have a2x squared, right? Yeah, why not? So you're going to do a1. So you're going to compute x squared, and then times a1. And the point doesn't come until the next one. What about x cubed? Are you going to do x times x times x times a3? You can do it. It's the right answer. But if you think about it, you already computed x squared. So why not just take that times x, and you save one multiplication? And I know it's hard to get your attention because uh, you know, what's the deal with the multiplication? But this is the speed of the algorithm. But if you imagine you know, before computers, when the multiplication took some, poor, uh, so, some, some worker who was actually sitting there counting, they used to do those things. They had whole rooms filled with people just doing arithmetic. You know, a multiplication could be five minutes of work and an error, a risk of an error. Then it would be really good to realize that x cubed is really x squared times x, right? So, Clearly, there are different, more or less efficient ways to, to evaluate the polynomial than the just naive thing of going term by term. Okay? And this is comparable to what, this is doing this in a really optimal way. It's Horner's method. And let me tell you what it does, and then we can show why it works. Uh, here's a polynomial. You define a new sequence b that looks confusing, but it is what it is. And when you get down to b0, you've evaluated p at x0. Okay. It's one quick sweep through the, these coefficients, and you actually end up getting this, uh, this polynomial out. You actually, this method is doing more, because it really divided out a factor x minus x0 from your p. And it's, these coefficients you compute are the q that you get out of it. Why do I have a b0 here? Why is that not 0 like I said before? I talked about dividing out factors before. Then I didn't have a b0. Why do I have a b0 now? What? 
That's a reminder. Why did I? Why do I have a reminder now, but not in the when I talked about the column before? Very good. Yeah. So here I, I I said that find a root x1 according to the th th fundamental theorem of algebra and divide it out, and you get a degree uh, one less polynomial, and you can keep on going. Right? No reminders because they were roots. Um, here x0 is whatever you want. We're just evaluating a polynomial, and as doing that you actually end up dividing p of x by x minus your number x0, which could be anything. And of course, in particular, if it is a root, we'll talk about a nice thing this do, do, will do to you. But you get, the, the, you get the, less, the one degree lower polynomial q out of it. But in general, there will be a remainder. OK? And we can actually also get the derivatives easily out of this. So this is a way to quickly do, quickly do some polynomial evaluation. Let me show you how, where it comes from. Uh, how do we prove something like that? No, uh, first an example. I'm doing the, the new pedagogical tools here. First showing how to use it and then prove it. And you know it better. All right, here's a polynomial. x5 minus 2x4 plus 3x3 minus 4. I just made up these numbers. They're not good. But they are hard enough to show the point plus 2, OK? And then you want to evaluate it at x0 equals minus 1. And I'm wondering, what is p of x of x0? So here's what you do. You write your a's. At n, let's call it i. You have a coefficient 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 and the constant. And these coefficients are 1, minus 2, plus 3, minus 4, plus 1, plus 2. Okay? I haven't done anything. I've just written down my polynomial. <coughs> k is a better name. Uh, I'm going to change to k. Sorry. I match the. All right, I haven't done anything. I just wrote the coefficients of my polynomial in order of decreasing um, a monomial degree, right? I just took my polynomial and wrote it down like that. Now here it comes, now we want to evaluate it at minus 1. And as I told you before, I mean minus 1 is a bad example because it's very easy to multiply by itself. Uh, but let's do it anyway. Um, as I said, you would probably do you know, 2 plus x, and then you keep on multiplying here. But there are all these patterns. By the way, x4 is, of course, either that one times x again, or you could do that one squared. There are many ways to do this more or less efficiently. This method will just use that simple recursion you have on the first equation line there. It defines a bunch of sequence, bunch of numbers bk, by simply taking the a k, k and adding in a little bit of this. Let's do it. The, it starts by saying bn is equal to an. bn, which is 5, is equal to an. There we go. All the other ones come from that formula, saying that you take this is equal to that times that plus that times x minus 1, OK? Just a few operations here. So minus 2 plus 1 times minus 1, which is minus 3. This is really easy to do quickly like this. This same, same all the way down. So that plus that times uh, minus 1, so that's 6. That plus this times minus 1, that's minus 10, if I'm doing it right. Yeah. This plus that times minus 1, 11. This plus that times minus 1, that's minus 9. OK? It's pretty easy, right? And this theorem is telling me a bunch of things. Um, this is equal to the polynomial evaluated at x0. And you can count operations and see that this was indeed uh, less work than going straight at the one up there. Uh, but of course, what's more so that we're going to use later is that these coefficients can all be used for something good, namely defining the q when you divide away that x. So we really didn't, didn't just evaluate it. We factored it and brought it down to a lower degree. So uh, why is this true? How do you prove that this formula works? Is it hard? 
Well, it might be hard to come up with it, but when someone tells you that it is there, it's really just a uh, plug-in. Corners method. So the proof is really just plug-in. Uh, so what we claim is that uh, there's a claim, right? And uh, if you think about it, uh, if px is equal to this here, then it's then the fact up here that I used here, namely that this is p minus 1, comes from that, right? Because if you plug in, in x0 in this expression, you kill this term, and out comes b0. So let's just go right at this claim and see if it's true. Question? Right? So x minus x0 times q of x. And there's a possible remainder, b0. And then you just use all these expressions. So um, what is q? Well, they tell you what q is. It's a polynomial of degree n minus 1. Just plug it in. So you have this x minus x0 multiplying this stuff. So it's going to be bn minus, mm, let's see, what do we call them? It's a little tricky that we call. So for whatever reason, these don't match because they come from the corresponding a. So bn is now to xn minus 1. Just, I'm just copying, but it's easy to make mistakes. Plus bn minus 1 x to the n minus 2, right? All the way down to how does it end? It ends in a b2 multiplying x and a b1. And since I started 1 to high, I don't have a b0. It comes there. Multiply in, and you get a bunch of terms. Uh, of course, when you multiply by x, you're bumping up all these exponents by 1, right? So the first sequence we're getting is bn x to the n all the way down to b1 multiplying x. Then I'm multiplying it by x0, which means I'm getting the same thing as before. And I'm going to put these x0s here. But they're still n minus 1, right? All the way down to b1 multiplying x0. And I still have my b0 up there. All right? Am I done proving this? Now you use, I mean, this is obviously how you could derive the expression, because you now you see what it has to be. You see that that bn, if this is to be equal to p of x, the original one, you see that x of n only appear once, right? So bn has to be equal to an. Um, I didn't write enough terms, but if you look at the next term, there's a bn minus 1 here, but here you're subtracting a bn x0 from here. We should be able to use that to define b0, b's, such that this is true. I mean, I'm going the reverse way. I'm, I'm saying, what do they have to be in order to match the polynomial? But of course, you can derive that expression. And to prove it, I'm just going to plug it in. So go up to the, the definition of the b's and plug them in. And you can see that they, let's, let's expand it out. There's going to be only a single bn popping out like that. That's not so interesting. Then what? Here we have a bn minus 1 multiplying x to the n minus 1. That's a bn minus 1. And here we have a uh, minus bn x0 multiplying the same thing, multiplying x n minus 1, right? It's clear that the next one will be a bn minus 2 multiplying, you know, a bn minus 1 x0. And it will just keep on going. So this ends in the following way. We have a b that is 1 lower than this b multiplying x0 with the power same as that one. This is a general pattern. And it ends with what? Well, let's collect the constant term. We still have our b0. Here's something that is not multiplied by any x's. So we just do b0 minus b1 x0. All right. So that was a nice step. This shows you that if these are equal to a, it's all good. And indeed, that's how they define them to be. They define that it, each of these, they define the bn to be equal to an. Right? So let's write that. 
then they defined uh, bn minus 1 to be equal to a n minus 1 plus the higher b coefficient times x0. So if you just move the third term, the second term on the right hand side there over to the left, you see that bn minus 1 minus bn x0 is equal to a n minus 1 plus a1 x plus a0. That's it. This is a simple proof, right? It's just someone tells you something, and it's all just algebra to show that it's true. Just plug in. Um, now, how about um, how about the, I mentioned this expression here comes directly straight out of that, right? So that's not too surprising. But uh, another little benefit is that you get, can get derivatives quite quickly out of this too. But I'm not sure I have all that much time to do for it. Let's let's look at the, how to do it in MATLAB. You could start, um, you know, it, the reason I want to show this is really just that it's just one sweep through. You could see it, it was almost better when I did it here. Because you just start at the high order terms and go down once. Each operation you're doing a simple multiplication and an addition, and you get a B. And when you're down there, you're done with the whole path. So evaluating and factoring. Uh, it turns out that we're also going to use this second expression here to get derivatives out of there, which this, this little code is doing. But I'll I'll do that later. There's no rush about this. This is, uh, we can cover next week more. All right, thank you. I have office hours now. Come with me if you have questions. <laughs>